introduce Dean Syrup, who will introduce the event topic and bring everything to order by passing it along to Kemp. So here we go. I will start admitting the attendees. Oh. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. My name is Anthony Porcelli, Senior Assistant Dean in the School of Health Professions and Human Services at Hofstra University. Tonight's evening, The State of Hope focuses on community approaches to mental health. Our event this evening is a part of Hofstra University's National Public Health Week 2022 event series. We will be beginning momentarily. I just wanna give everyone the chance who has had the opportunity to register for our event, the ability to sign on. And uh, usually we give it about a few minutes before formally getting started. But thank you so much for being with us tonight. We really appreciate it. The State of Hope series came to Hofstra's campus in October of 2019. We have had periodic events on various topics related to health policy since that time. Our event series created and facilitated by the Honorable Kemp Hannon, New York State Senator representing the 6th District from 1989 to 2018 has been a great part of the School of Health Professions and Human Services. And we're delighted to have all of you with us this evening. We'll just give it one more moment before formally starting. And we're thrilled to have all of you with us. All right, everybody, thank you again once more for joining us this evening. My name is Anthony Porcelli, Senior Assistant Dean in the School of Health Professions and Human Services. Tonight's event, The State of Hope, is focusing on community approaches to mental health. This event is a part of the 2022 National Public Health Week event series at Hofstra University. At this time, it is my absolute pleasure to welcome the Dean of our school, Dr. Holly Syrup, the opportunity to speak prior to our event getting started. Dean Syrup joined Hofstra University 40 years ago and has been a fixture of leadership on campus since that time. Past roles held by Dean Syrup include Executive Dean of Students, Vice President for Campus Life, and after serving in the role of Vice President for Campus Life for 11 years, she transitioned to the faculty where she is a full professor in the departments of educational leadership and counseling and mental health professions. Dean Syrup rejoined Hofstra's administration in 2016, becoming the Vice Dean of the School of Health Professions and Human Services, and then the Dean of the school. Since Dean Syrup's tenure in the School of Health Professions and Human Services, our enrollment has grown by over 60% and the number of graduate opportunities has increased significantly within our school. Dean Syrup was named one of the top 50 women in business by the Long Island Business News in 2019. It is now my pleasure to ask Dean Syrup to unmute herself and the floor is yours. Great. Thank you, Tony. We're not supposed to mention those 40 years. I have to tell people that I came when I was in the daycare center now. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the State of Hope. As Tony mentioned, the State of Hope, or Healthcare Opportunities and Policy Exchange, was created to provide an outlet for the community to come together to discuss contemporary issues in healthcare and the impact on current and future policy. Today's event is one of a full program of events in the celebration of National Public Health Week. 
the overarching theme of our 2022 National Public Health Week is the power of communities in health. And you can see clearly how this program's topic, community approaches to mental health, is so relevant to our theme. And the discussion couldn't be more timely as it comes at a time when the number of individuals who've been identified with mental health concerns have increased steadily and noticeably from before the COVID-19 pandemic to present day. A recent study by the Kaiser Family Foundation found that there's been a significant increase in reported cases of individuals with mental health symptoms. Specifically in 2019, again, prior to COVID-19, the prevalence of individuals with reported mental health symptoms related to anxiety and or depressive disorder was about 11%. In October, 2021, that increased to 31%. And more alarming, of the 31%, only 26% reported receiving some type of care. The report also describes that while cases are increasing, the current system can't accommodate that need for care. Recognizing the challenges and concerns pertaining to mental health, it has become a topic of discussion at all the levels. In fact, the American Public Health Association has referenced the importance of mental health by designating it as one of their priorities with a call to action for this year. Furthermore, in a recent proclamation, President Biden has specifically highlighted the importance of addressing mental health by referring to mental health as an endemic, taking a toll on our children, veterans, service personnel, and persons from all cultures and all communities. As President Biden stated, and it's a quote, it takes all of us to preserve the health of our nation. And together we are poised to make tremendous progress to build a better, stronger, and healthier America. He is challenging all of us to move forward toward allowing everyone opportunities, residents of all communities, to be able to obtain access and opportunities to receive the mental health care that they need. And that will make us a healthier, healthier and stronger nation. With that in mind, I truly look forward to hearing today's discussion. I would like to thank our speakers who have been so generous to share their experience, insight, and expertise. And now it's my honor to introduce our moderator, Camp Hannon, Health Policy Fellow in the School of Health Professions and Human Services, to introduce our panelists and to facilitate our discussion. Camp? Thank you very much, Dean, sir. Appreciate it. Welcome everybody to Public Health Week. And that's this is our uh, premier webcast uh, during the week. This is the State of Hope, which stands for uh, the HOPE, Health Opportunities and Policy Exchange. Um, probably a little too overarching, but uh, that's, that's the title. And we're in the School of Health Professions and Human Services at Hofstra. And we wanted to discuss behavioral health in the community. We have some very, very uh, articulate and distinguished individuals who practiced in the field and uh, willing to share their views and insights as we go along. <clears throat> it, as Dean Sarah pointed out, this is very, a hot, very much of a hot topic, a very much of a needed uh, focus that we have uh, in, in our health uh, endeavors in, in the United States. Uh, looked at uh, President Biden's state of the state in March 1, looked at his, the budget they presented just last week. <clears throat> Very big focus on mental and behavioral health, uh, pointing the need for how much needs to be done yet. It was 2008 that the Mental Parity Act was passed by Congress. I think it was called the uh, Wellness uh, Wellstone Demonici uh, Act. And uh, since then, um, there's been a noticeable uptick in treatment as to uh, people who are uh, getting treated for mental, mental illness. I won't go went through all the statistics, but Fair Health, a not-for-profit statistic agency, which has access to billing by uh, medical managed care, um, did, a, did a retrospective study recently, and it pointed out that of all of the growth in um, billings for mental health, that the pediatric population uh, outstruck everybody else. Um, pediatric uh, zero to 22. And uh, of all of those, uh, the claims uh, college students were almost 400% greater than the rest of the adult population. 
and of the different uh, disorders that were uh, strikingly uh, showed an increase in Billings, it was anorexia and eating disorders. Um, something we hear about, but you don't get a chance to put in a statistical fashion. So the, um, to start off, we want to, I want to introduce, we have uh, Professor Laurie Johnson, uh, Dr. Jeff Reynolds, and Dr. Manish Sapra. Uh, Dr. Johnson is the, uh, has been teaching at the Department of Counseling and Mental Health Professions at Hofstra uh, since 1989, and uh, served for a great number of years as director of the graduate programs in counseling. During the time when she was serving there, uh, she did research in terms of uh, other areas such as North Ireland, uh, Cyprus, um, Bosnia, Herzegovina, um, doing academic work, doing uh, pu publishing work. Um, and she's now focused her research in the area of integrated behavioral health care, currently developing curriculum modules and training sites for Hoster's uh, mental health counseling students. An absolute need, as you will see as we have this discussion, uh, because we, as many other parts of healthcare, lack the workers, uh, lack the skilled professionals uh, to treat the needs of, of the population. So with that, Dr. Johnson, I'm going to allow you to uh, share your insights with us. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Dean Syrup, for your welcome, and uh, Kemp for your uh, kind remarks, and for inviting me to join in this webinar panel. Um, I'm very pleased to be a part of a discussion that focuses on uh, a topic that's very near and dear to my heart and defines my professional life. Uh, as most of us know, mental health has been a topic that carries significant stigma in society. And because of this, there's been an inadequate attention, discussion, acknowledgement, and advocacy of services uh, given to mental health as a public health issue in this country. Um, however, as noted already, um, in the last decade, 10, 12 years, uh, we've actually become more aware of the major impact that mental health has on our overall health. Uh, perhaps this is due to uh, the many travesties and tragedies we've experienced as a society where the perpetrators are associated with some form of mental health uh, concern. And so more and more people are aware that this is a issue that uh, affects all of society. And in fact, if not addressed properly, will in fact negatively impact the overall health of society. Um, when we speak about mental illness, we're including depression and anxiety, substance abuse, suicide as chief concerns that are affecting large swaths of the population at this time. We know that the increased statistics are there. I'll mention a few, some have already been mentioned, but there's no question that we're moving toward an increased understanding of the significance and the prevalence of mental illness in our society. Um, the biggest challenges from a public health perspective, being this is public health week, the biggest challenge that I think most of us would uh, identify uh, related to mental health include breaking down the stigma that exists surrounding mental health and seeking mental health treatment, and also providing better access to services. These are the two primary areas that I'm focusing on in my comments today. <clears throat> As such, uh, the argument can be made for reframing the notion of mental health, which has always been kind of put in the psychological framework, um, as reframing it as a public health concern. And I think this is a healthy way forward. Um, some statistics, again, I don't wanna to get too far into the, the statistical piece of it, but it does give us a picture of the depth uh, and breadth of the, of, the of the population that we're focusing on. The National Institutes of Mental Health have estimated that 47% of people will be diagnosed with a mental health disorder sometime during their life. It's a pretty significant uh, proportion of the population. 
We know that depression is a leading cause of both injury and disease for people, not only in the United States, but around the world. I've spent time as uh, in the role of an international uh, mental health facilitator, where we go to countries that do not have well-established mental health service systems, and we attempt to work with the local individuals there, whether they be uh, teachers or religious clergy or spokespeople for villages, etc., to help bring some increased recognition of offering support to those with mental health dilemmas. So it's really only second to the, the statistics suggest that mental health concerns are only second to heart disease as a leading cause of disability in the world. Um, in the United States, we have probably close to 25% of adult uh, adults who have more one or more mental uh, disorders in any given year. This comes from the Centers for Disease Control. Uh, another statistic that's alarming is that suicide has reached uh, such frequency levels that it's now considered the 12th leading cause of death in the United States. Um, some have said, again, uh, looking at these numbers, it's almost incredible that on, on average, 130 people commit suicides each day. So beyond the, the general population, as we look at uh, the concern, current research has shown that there's increased rates of mental illness and mental health conditions from marginalized groups. This is no surprise to most of us, um, including people of color, refugee groups, members of the LGBTQ plus community and indigenous people. So we have a, a generalized population of high statistics and an increased uh, incidence among marginalized populations. People in marginalized communities experience uh, <clears throat> worse mental health uh, conditions <clears throat> because of social determinants oftentimes. Um, in other words, the mental health incidents that occurs in these communities are often due to preventable reasons. Blacks are at a higher risk for mental health concerns. LGBTQ uh, uh, individuals experience depression, anxiety, and substance abuse at over two times the, the, uh, the rate for heterosexuals. Uh, so this is all giving us a picture of how significant this uh, concern is and how it impacts not only society and at a, as a whole, but individual groups within it. Despite the growing incidence, uh, there remains poor access to mental health services. So that's part of what we're here to explore today. Uh, how can we address this poor access to mental health services so that these numbers that are affected can actually be supported and helped? Um, in 2020, there was a study done by Mental Health America, um, which indicated that over half of adults uh, with a mental health disorder received no treatment. I think it was mentioned before by Dean Syrup in her introductory co uh, comments, um, and that almost a quarter of adults with mental health condition reported they were unable to receive treatment needed. Uh, and the reasons were for different, uh, you know, different reasons all across the board, some of which had to do with lack of opportunity, uh, et cetera. I'll talk a little bit about some of the challenges to access in a few minutes. I don't think any of us who are here in attendance today uh, doubt the fact that uh, the impact, the societal impact of mental illness is multi-layered and, and very significant. Um, estimates are that mental and a mental illness or mental health conditions um, can reduce life expectancy by 20 years. This is partially because of the uh, correlation uh, mental health concerns have with physical health. Um, behavioral health disorders frequently co-occur with chronic uh, physical health conditions, and so this is part of the the issue. It's it's it, to look at mental health only through the psychological perspectives um, and to look at it from a, uh, a, a individualized uh, perspective related to 
the internal mechanisms and dynamics of individuals is a very short and narrow uh, reference to use. Looking at it as looking at it from the perspective, a holistic perspective, where the physical and the mental are indeed part of the whole. Um, I think close to two thirds of adults with mental health uh, conditions have physical health conditions. This is the data that comes from CDC and almost one third with physical health conditions have co-occurring mental health conditions. So this is where this marriage comes into play that has not been up until recently uh, adequately identified and addressed. Um, looking at children and adolescents as a specific subpopulation of the overall population, um, we know that one in six children between the ages of two and eight years old has a mental, behavioral, or developmental disorder. Um, this was mentioned just uh, um, a few minutes ago when you referred to the fact that pediatric care is the area in which the largest uh, indication of mental health concerns for a population are emanating. And we see that, and I think Dr. Sapper will talk about it too when he speaks to integrated behavioral health care, that the pediatric population uh, is significant in terms of uh, the, the incidence of mental health concerns. Um, as many as half of adolescents, so from you know, 12 to 17, suffer from mental health uh, condition. So with all of this, it sounds like a very gloomy presentation and I apologize because the latter part of our discussion is going to be related to what good is happening, the movement that is being directed towards addressing this. But I think I, I'm setting this foundation so that we all understand the significance of the issue and the, the impact across society. Um, among adolescents, we're increasingly seeing significant concerns with depression, substance use, and suicide. I know Dr. Reynolds was, is a great uh, expert in, in that area, working uh, on, the, uh, on the ground with uh, youth throughout the region in these areas. Uh, suicide's the second leading cause of death in uh, young ad in adolescents and young adults. So moving a little bit beyond the statistics, uh, I wanted to, to talk about some of what we recognize as being part of the risk factors or the factors that contribute to increased risk for mental health concerns. Um, we know that there are social determinants that have uh, primary influence in how a young person will uh, be able to negotiate the world and move forward in a healthy way. Among children living below the poverty level, for example, almost one quarter have a mental, behavioral, or developmental disorder. Um, in looking at, I have a colleague who works in the corrections, who has had experience in corrections, and the statistics there uh, is that for uh, those youth in juvenile system, many of whom disproportionately are children of color, 75%, three out of four have mental disorders. So our children are winding up in uh, correctional uh, facilities uh, and the juvenile system again, because of this lack of access um, that, that has colored the field. We're now learning more about adverse childhood events. Uh, we refer to these uh, with, the, with the acronym ACES, A-C-E-S, adverse childhood events. But there's been significant research over the last uh, decade or so about adverse childhood events. The National Institutes of Health define ACEs or adverse childhood events as stressful or traumatic life events that occurred during the first 18 years of life, such as physical or emotional or sexual abuse or neglect um, or other forms of family dysfunction or societal trauma that, that are per pervasive in their lives. So these ACEs now are being looked at as being significant risk factors uh, for children as they grow uh, through the lifespan. They're associated with children's poor mental health. Um, the recognition now 
is, is now greatly influencing our understanding of behavioral health problems, how we address them. Um, and uh, we are now in the field, certainly we're, we're training uh, new practitioners and those in practice are becoming more and more adept at what we call trauma-informed practice, moving into clinical therapeutic relationships uh, with the uh, assessment standard of, of assessing for trauma in one's background. Uh, and this is, I think, an advancement that has occurred in the field of psychological therapy as a result of this research. Um, as I mentioned before, and as we all know, uh, there are barriers to people obtaining mental health services. Some of them are quite obvious, I'm sure. Uh, in general, there's a stigma surrounding mental health, and uh, this has had the consequential uh, result of people being reluctant to access mental health services or to be identified as someone who needs mental health support. So that has kept a, a poor part of our population uh, away. Uh, cultural mores in different cultural groups, there are mores and negative perceptions that discourage uh, individuals in those communities from seeking mental health services. Either mental health services are not seen as trusted or they're not valued. Uh, oftentimes, and this is, a, is, is increasingly becoming part of our awareness and what we in the field, traditional mental health practitioners are now encouraging, which is seeking out support from non-traditional mental health uh, service providers in the community. So let's so let's ex, let's con, explore that. That's sure. Per, superb opening, setting the stage for everything, and ask that uh, we further develop it with Dr. Reynolds, who is the president and CEO of Nassau's and Long Island's Family and Children's Association. Um, he has been doing this after he came to Family and Children's from LICAD, which is. Uh, and coming from uh, the HIV organization, immense, immense practical experience on the ground in running organizations and treating problems with society. Um, serves on more task force, has written more articles, puts me totally to shame. Um, I stand in great admiration and we're lucky to get in his busy day, uh, him to join us. Dr. Reynolds, if you could build on what Professor Johnson has set the stage for. I hope so. And you've given me a grand buildup now in the intro. And so I'm not only thankful, but feel a little bit of pressure here along the way. So um, thank you for having me. Always a good uh, opportunity to see you again, Kemp. And, um, you know, talking with you recently about planning this has given me a great chance to reflect on all your great work in the state Senate. And so thank you for that. Um, I don't think we can thank you enough for a lot of the services that continue to exist today. So. Thank you. You know, look, when, when we talk about children's mental health, we talk about adolescent mental health, and we talk about COVID, you know, we look at the statistics post pandemic, or as we approach the next phase of the pandemic, and we talk about how worse things got. The reality is mental health issues in kids didn't arrive with the outset of COVID. The reality is this was one of those pre-existing conditions that was worsened by COVID, but wasn't necessarily caused by it. If you think about COVID, we've had several rounds of COVID now, and I think that's left a lot of young people and quite frankly, adults, including their parents, with a sense of uncertainty. In fact, I heard one podcaster, Brene Brown, who described it as we've been fenced in in almost like a prison-like environment with barbed wire for the longest time, and suddenly we've been given permission to climb out, and we started to climb out yet our shirt has gotten caught on the, the back of the barbed wire. And every time we try to walk away, we get pulled back into masks and isolation and notices from school that it, your kid's been exposed. I think that weighs on kids more than anything else. There's a reason our kids' lives are structured in the way they are. And kids thrive in a structured environment. Uncertainty weighs heavily on everybody, especially young people. Um, factor into the past two years, um, a Black Lives Matter movement, in which, which we began to acknowledge, understand, and rebel against the overt racism that impacts so many folks in our communities. We now have a war in Ukraine, um, where we've seen images almost on a nightly basis of 
pregnant moms being wheeled out of hospitals all bloody. We've seen pictures like we've never seen before of the horrors of war. Our kids are taking all of that in. And so I think there's a number of things that are, that are going on here. Um, and as you heard from Professor Johnson, the statistics are pretty significant, like nothing we've ever seen before. You know, here at FCA, uh, we currently run about 30 programs. We serve 34,000 people a year. One of our busier programs right now is our children's mental health programs in which we provide community-based mental health services to around 300 kids and their families. I would say, you know, these generally are kids that already have a psychiatric diagnosis, um, but the problems aren't limited to that population. And among that population where I would get an attempted suicide report every couple of months, now I'm seeing a couple per week. Um, and so things have really taken off. I'm getting lots of calls from parents who are saying, um, you know, I felt like I was well adjusted. I felt like I had everything managed, but I don't feel like I got it anymore. And you have entire households that are beginning to struggle, sometimes together, sometimes apart. One of the other statistic points that came out of the CDC report that came out last week was about the amount of child abuse and neglect that happened during um, the pandemic. And for a long time, there were these reports coming out saying, you know, it's counterintuitive, but child abuse reports actually dropped during COVID. Well, they did because kids were no longer going to schools and interacting with social workers. They were no longer out in the community. And so these kids were struggling with stressed out families um, all by themselves in isolation. And the only thing worse than um, a mental health disorder is dealing with that in isolation. So anxiety and depression um, took hold even in folks that we would consider to be the most well-adjusted, whatever that means. Um, but we saw that increase across the board for almost every population, almost every community. There are a couple of things kind of in the mix here, and we haven't yet spent a lot of time talking about substance use disorders, but it warrants a conversation here because very often the two things, whether it's a psychiatric diagnosis or an SUD diagnosis are dealt with separately. And in fact, Kemp, you know this, we have two separate state agencies that deal with those problems. When in fact, you know, if you're an adolescent that's using substances or in a lot of cases an adult for that matter, there's a pretty good chance that it wasn't boredom, it wasn't peer pressure alone. It was anxiety or depression that led you into using for the first time. And for those young people who use the first time, they'll say, well, it's the first time I ever felt like I fit in. It's the first time I ever felt normal. And so during COVID in the general population, because people tend to use um, pills and powders and potions during times of stress, we saw an increase in alcohol sales, sales here in New York State by 35%. And if you think about it, it was one of the few essential services where, you know, not only was alcohol still available, you could actually get it home delivered, you could get restaurant takeout. And so when people are stressed, they drink more. And that happened in adults, which impacts families, but it also happened in young people. Um, here in New York State, we've seen the legalization of cannabis, uh, which has resulted in an increase in cannabis use among young people. Um, the sky doesn't fall under the legalization of cannabis, but when it coincides with a global pandemic that predominantly affects the lungs, it raises some public health concerns. And when you take an unprecedented amount of stress and put it on kids and families, not shockingly, you're going to see an uptick in use. Um, at the same time, this region, our entire state, and probably our nation has struggled under the weight of an opioid crisis that now goes back 20 years. We can probably do five of these webcasts talking about how we got to that place, why we got there and the strategies for getting out. But the reality is, at least in our region, um, fatal overdoses rose by 30%. Um, as we had finally begun to make some gains and started turning the corner, um, we gave back a lot of those gains during COVID. And part of that was, you know, why do people use opioids? They use opioids because they make pain go away. And while opioids work great on physical pain, they also work pretty good on psychological pain as well. And so we almost had the perfect storm. But the last component, the final component of that perfect storm really was the barriers to treatment for folks who were interested in getting care. And so it's hard to recall back to the days when we saw hospital units being emptied to make room for COVID patients. But I can remember telling my son who was on a skateboard, you better not fall because the ambulance isn't going to come and pick you up. It's full of COVID patients and you can't go to the hospital. And so 
you know, when I think about what happened locally, there were detoxes that were emptied during COVID. There were drug treatment facilities that stopped taking people. And we watched those people, the very same measures that protected people, whether it was social isolation or making room in the hospitals, the measures that protected people from COVID put them at higher risk for other things, including a fatal overdose. There too, not new because of COVID, it was a pre-existing condition, but it got worse during the, the pandemic. That lack of access to, to treatment, one of the things that we thought was pretty cool is, well, we'll all just flip over to telehealth and everything will be okay. And although it's not exactly the same, it's a reasonable facsimile that's better than nothing. That worked well for some people some of the time. I will say that most of the frontline not-for-profit organizations, um, quite frankly, we don't do capital investments. We spend money on services for people today. And so I didn't even have a webcam on my computer before COVID hit. Um, never mind our staff. I'm the CEO and I didn't have that. Um, and then when we start talking about our consumers and our families, most of them didn't have that access either. And so one of the things we figured out during COVID is that um, the sicker you were, um, the less effective telehealth would be. If you had garden variety anxiety or some problems here and there and a reasonably supportive family and a private place to talk and the right technology, it actually eliminated some transportation or barriers to care that we see, especially among young people. If, however, you had a complicating condition, you had a family that didn't know that you were struggling with particular issues, you didn't have a reasonable expectation of privacy, um, or that you had a higher level of impairment, we know that um, telehealth was not a suitable replacement for, for a lot of people. And again, the lack of resources is significant. You know, Kemp, you were around at a time where there was lots of discussion at a state level and that, you know, we ought to stop throwing people into inpatient settings. It's expensive, it's dehumanizing, the outcomes are terrible. Let's plow our investments into community-based care. Um, and a lot of those investments materialized, but a fair amount did not. And the investment was insufficient to support the needs, certainly pre-COVID, but absolutely in a post-COVID environment. You know, the last thing I wanna mention, and we spent a lot of this discussion talking about kids, and for us, that's a sweet spot. And we saw it in LGBTQ kids. We run the only shelter for runaway and homeless and traffic kids on Long Island. Our census was up 20% not so much on the traffic side of things, um, although we did see some of that, but for LGBTQ kids who then had to be home 24 seven and being with your homophobic parents for three hours a day is different than having to be together with them for 24 hours a day. And it made it really hard for some of those kids. But one of the populations that we saw a huge amount of distress in, and it does relate to the entire family system is our seniors. And so when you look at the populations that really got the short end of the stick during COVID, and we can quibble about who's to blame for the nursing home fiascos, there's a lot of seniors who didn't have good access to care, who died alone in nursing homes, trying to have some last level of contact with their families via FaceTime. Um, there were kids who watched their grandparents die in nursing homes alone and isolated and frightened and scared. And there's a ripple effect to all of that. Just because we have vaccines for COVID now and booster shots doesn't mean that we have it for all of the trauma that folks have experienced. And Professor Johnson was really eloquent in talking about um, trauma-based care and kind of where things are going and how they impact your future development. We have an entire generation of kids who is feeling inadequate about the fact that they've suffered learning loss along the way, who feel isolated from their peers who they might be able to turn to for support who have watched their parents struggle perhaps with joblessness or COVID themselves and have watched their grandparents die in nursing homes. That doesn't go away overnight. And so I guess my plea at the, at the end of this would really be, you know, we've got our, we've got a challenge laid out before us, a challenge that potentially lasts for another generation or two post COVID. But the challenge is something that we haven't done a great job with in the past. We're pretty good at dealing with physical disorders that you can see and touch and quantify and that don't come with stigma. Where things get tricky is when we talk about conditions that are above the neck or conditions that come with some level of stigma. We're also really good at short-term solutions, but not so great at longer-term solutions. And I'm afraid this requires a longer-term solution. Um, so that would be 
my plea. Really anxious to uh, hear from um, the rest of the panelists and to get some questions. But thank you again for having me. I truly appreciate it. Thank you very much, Doctor. Um, to anybody watching, if you have a question, if you want to put it in chat, um, we'll try to attempt to uh, respond to all the questions that might be raised. Uh, the irony when you talk about uh, Dr. Reynolds about the support from the state is that there was recently a ProPublica story about uh, the promise the state had made uh, to take the money that would be saved from having uh, children and adults institutionalized and put it into community care and how that money really didn't follow. Ironically, or coincidentally, things are never really uh, ironic, is that the end of March of 2022, the state was sued. Uh, it was sued for uh, the defendants, which was basically the state of New York and the departments, a longstanding failure to provide Medicaid eligible children with adequate adult, uh, me uh, adequate mental health services, and then uh, to uh, uh, did not supposedly make available services that should have been there under the Medicaid program. So there has been, this is, and this started pre-pandemic and continues, um, a real, real uh, point that the state is failing to meet its, its obligations. But that gives me as a transition because I wanted to now introduce Dr. Manash Sapra, who is actually uh, spearheading actual accomplishments in regard to uh, dealing with physical and mental health. He is the executive director of the Behavioral Health Services line at Northwell Health oversees strategic clinical program development and physician management for all mental health and substance abuse disorder programs at Northwell. Northwell, which has 20 plus hospitals um, dealing with physical and, and mental. Um, previously, he had been director of strategic initiatives for the behavioral health service line and medical director of practice-based care management at Northwell. Um, he came to uh, Northwell after uh, Associate Chief of Clinical Services at University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, uh, a major uh, medical facility in Western uh, Pennsylvania. Um, Dr. 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 Sapra has uh, a few short slides of great clarity of intelligence, and I will let the floor be yours, Dr. Sapra. Thank you, Dr. Um, thank you. Uh... Senator Hennan for that uh, introduction. I want to thank the other panelists uh, for really laying out the situation. Uh, I, I, I could not agree with every comment that, was, that has been made already about uh, where we, you know, sort of laying out uh, the landscape of the need for behavioral health services and some of the challenges as Dr. Johnson was saying about stigma and uh, access to care. Uh, I briefly want to talk about uh, COVID and COVID's impact uh, because that's relevant to what I want to speak next. Um, and and I, I want to talk about how that has changed how we access care and how we think about behavioral health. So one comment that was already made about telehealth, um, it has revolutionized uh, how we are providing uh, behavioral health care or even meeting each other as we are on video conferencing right now. Um, it is true that uh, even in a large health system, we had a very few um, psychiatrists, psychologists who would uh, have a webcam on their uh, laptops or, or computers or feel comfortable even if we brought them in. In fact, my challenges pre-COVID was uh, convincing our providers to accept telepsychiatry and teletherapy. Uh, but that changed overnight uh, and it changed on the provider side and also on, on, on the side of the patients and this acceptance of, of video conferencing as a technology to communicate with. And we can talk about, you know, where it works, where it does not, but, but generally that is something that, um, that we are accepting. Uh, the other revolution that's sort of happening in mental health, again, does not address significantly many of these issues that we brought up, but is in, in digital mental health and mental health apps. There are like 10,000 mental health apps. Uh, if you go to your app store, 
uh, on your smartphone uh, and for different conditions and addressing different populations and, and trying to reach out. Uh, and I think there is a lot of buzz about this uh, uh, more than there is a, a clear solution. Um, but there, uh, there is suddenly a significant movement. And when the dust settles, we will have a few good products that will help us um, with, with many of these uh, situations that we talked about, you know, whether it is confidential treatment, addressing stigma or, or improving access. I wanna talk about another thing, uh, which is the increase in demand as, as um, Dr. Reynolds was talking about in his services, uh, he's seeing increase uh, incidence of, uh, of, of, you know, whether it's societal thoughts or societal behaviors, but also demand for outpatient services. We're seeing that certainly across our health system. Um, and the, the other problem for, related to that is we just do not have the workforce to, to take all that on. Um, we cannot just you know, go ahead and, and hire uh, hundreds of more psychiatrists, psychologists, uh, or other therapists uh, for several reasons, um, but primarily because they're not there out there. You know, it's uh, every, every system, every provider is struggling with recruitment and, and, and there's a significant workforce issue in, in behavioral health, which has been further impacted by the increased demand of services with, with uh, post-pandemic or, or, you know, as we're going through the pandemic. Um, there are the troubles as, as they were mentioned earlier. And finally, one more thing I wanna mention about stigma. I do feel like, you know, there are, there is a focus on behavioral health that somehow, and I think our, our children and youth are leading this charge, there is some normalizing of, of seeking mental health services because of, uh, of these ongoing st uh, stresses, whether we you know, talk about COVID, racial disparities, uh, or now um, effects of the war, people are seeking out help. Um, I also feel like employers um, who are a big part of how health services are engineered and, and, and provided in, in this country are, are recognizing and behavioral health, and there's more and more um, focus on on uh, services uh, to uh, behavioral health services for employees and well-being services. I think all those are are developments that we should, you know, mainly positive uh, from the pandemic that are revolutionizing and changing uh, how we're providing services. So if you go to the next slide, please, uh, I do wanna talk about integrated services. Um, so broadly, um, I wanna talk about uh, how one accesses mental health. And this is a, a visual uh, that I actually uh, provide to many, uh, many of our uh, administrators and, and non-behavioral health individuals within the system to, to, to give them a little um, insight into what ambulatory behavioral health looks like. And if you can imagine uh, a severity or a complexity level from left to right, going from uh, uh, least severe to, to more uh, severe. So uh, the integrated care model, and especially with all the things that we can do with virtual, as, uh, as Dr. Reynolds was saying, you know, with, with use of telepsychiatry and all, sort of works better in mild to moderate depression and anxiety. Uh, and it's really a model where uh, primary care physicians or pediatricians can take on treatment of, of common behavioral health conditions and become comfortable with it. It's a, it's a population health model where uh, psychiatrists and behavioral health counselors are disseminating their expertise to a broader uh, set of providers in the community. Uh, and we'll, we'll talk more about it in, in detail. Uh, but the next model is a sessional or co-located model uh, where, and I, we call it sessions as in like, you know, in terms of setting up practices, psychiatrists or therapists would go in for a few hours um, a week and work at a practice where people are already coming in for other illnesses. It could be a primary care office or it could be a specialty office to to an oncologist or a gastroenterologist, uh, where um, patients may be going through a psychiatric or psychological issue um, that can be addressed by those providers in that subspecialty uh, center directly, but not 
uh, through uh, their primary care providers. Then of course, what we understand as an ambulatory psychiatry practice, and I'm sorry for the acronyms, which are really not all specific, um, but um, we have the, these practices where you can just come in and see a psychiatrist or, or a therapist as you would. We've tried to make, make some subspecialty programs, especially in a, in a large academic program at Zucker Hill Cyber I'm uh, speaking uh, to you from, which is a, uh, is a 222 bed psychiatric hospital and, and has several outpatient programs. We've developed subspecialty programs so, such as focusing on obsessive compulsive disorder, bipolar disorder, uh, and, and other psychiatric illnesses. We've, we're developing interventional psychiatry programs which combine ECT, recent uh, treatments of, of ketamine and psychedelics uh, and temporal magnetic stimulation. So those are like some of your specialized centers. And then uh, we have a partial hospital intensive outpatient programs, so programs with um, case management. Many of those programs are, are familiar with Dr. Reynolds from his side, where, where they are also providing, you know, anything from I would imagine from the range of, of ambulatory practices to partial hospital and intensive outpatient program. Next slide, please. So I just wanted to start with this slide to give you an idea of where integrated care comes in, uh, but it's, it also gives you an idea of how to access behavioral health based on complexity. So the primary care integration model uh, essentially uh, works by bringing in additional resources to a primary care practice. This starts with, uh, so the, there is a patient and, uh, and the primary care physician in the diagram here. Uh, and what we bring in is a behavioral health care manager who could be um, a licensed uh, uh, medical social worker, a licensed uh, clinical social worker, or a licensed mental health counselor. Uh, we also have some doctorate uh, level individuals in our program, and they get supervision from a psychiatrist. Uh, so the direct context is between the patient and, and, and primary care physician, but the supervising psychiatrists available for any kind of escalation or um, direct supervision to the, uh, to the care manager or a, uh, a curbside consultation to primary care physician. Through this model, by training our primary care physicians, we are able to and monitor treatment of depression and anxiety across the full panel. We screen every patient that comes to a primary care physician's office. We um, uh, do a depression and anxiety scale every month on an individual who's enrolled in the program. And if people are not getting better, the psychiatrist will ping um, the primary care physician and the care manager and advise medication changes. Uh, and then we follow up to see if those things have been helpful or not. Next slide, please. I, this is a, a story, a timeline of how this program developed. Uh, we started back in 2015 as the evidence base for this kind of a program developed across the country. Really started out from University of Washington. Uh, uh, and since then, there have been several randomized controlled trials. Um, and there's a significant evidence uh, that has built on the effectiveness of this model. Um, New York State uh, provided us funding uh, through the DISRIP uh, program. Uh, and, and really uh, promoted the, uh, as part of the, the healthcare reforms is building these programs across the system. And we added significant more slide, uh, sites. Uh, there is actually now a way to get reimbursed for these services in the fee-for-service model, which is still remains the main model that how we get paid for in, in behavioral health, especially in, in New York area. Um, and we started utilizing that back in 2018 and, and somehow reaching some, some sustainability there. Uh, we, ex we expanded the program to, to last year about 45 practices. During COVID, we went virtual, which actually helped us expand uh, during the pandemic uh, because we could work, you know, uh, we didn't have the geographical barriers. We could spread uh, several therapists, I mean, or a therapist over several sites. Uh, and we did a major expansion just uh, on 15th of March, added another 20 sites, and we plan to, by the end of 2022, uh, uh, be live on about 88 sites across the system. Um, that will include both primary care, pediatrics, and uh, we have started 
now actually integrating also in OBGYN practices. Next slide, please. I wanted to talk about beyond primary care uh, and, and uh, which is, uh, and I think relevant to this audience, our access to school, um, uh, schools and colleges, uh, because I think that's another place where we can integrate services and, uh, and develop the workforce that can, that can uh, you know, meet these challenges as we have been talking about. So we have a robust school mental health services program at Northwell. We have contracts with uh, over 32 school districts at this time and 193 schools uh, where we, um, uh, the schools get together and, and fund a program or a behavioral health clinic, which is staffed by a child psychiatrist, a counselor and other services, which provides same day access or next day access. Um, and we started with a program at, uh, at Cohen's um, here at, uh, at Sacramento Hillside campus in, uh, in LIJ. And then we added, um, we added a behavioral center, Rockwell Center, then in Mineola, and we're planning another one in Smithtown at this time. Um, it's really a robust program. It starts at the school. We do consultations within schools. We have child psychiatrists observing kids in the school, uh, talking uh, to teachers, you know, doing ca uh, casual consultations, not actually assessments. But then we also provide, um, uh, you know, full comprehensive assessments and linkages to higher uh, levels of programs as needed uh, within our system. We have, a, I don't have a slide on this. So this is my last slide, um, but we also have a very robust college mental health program where we help counseling centers uh, with escalation protocols. And we have an inpatient unit at Sacra Hill side that is dedicated to college students. And we're expanding our ability to provide ambulatory programs in those uh, uh, for those populations. So I'll be happy to talk more about these things, but I wanted to highlight a few of the areas where we're providing integrated services. And the theme really here is on developing a workforce and creating programs that are effective, engaging, uh, provided in a destigmatizing um, location. We, we try to reach the patient where they already are. And, um, you know, hopefully uh, are able to do this more efficiently and with the limited resources that we have to our disposal. So I'll end here. I'm happy to have further discussion and, and take questions. Doctor, <clears throat> I'm wondering, I'm going back to your second slide and I looked at the uh, relationship of a supervising care manager, a supervising psychiatrist and the primary care physician and uh, wonder um, what type of workload that requires of the care manager, of the uh, supervising psychiatrist, because I know in the field of mental health, you have a shortage of workers. And to the extent, um, do, does it, how many, how many uh, primary care uh, physicians can be supervised by those two individuals? Uh, is it easily expandable or not? It seems to me that you know, um, uh, you're, you probably are going through a great deal of sense of accomplishment when you mention your last expansion to 88 this year. And I'm thinking, well, 88, we, we still have, uh, what do we have? Uh, two and a half million people on Long Island and, and what, is, what is the need for it? And whether it's Northwell or whether it's NYU or whether it's Mount Sinai um, does this as a model be something that they could pick up? Yeah, it is, uh, as I said, a nationally recognized model. And, and I have to say New York State has done a lot of work on, on developing uh, this model and funding it and, uh, uh, you know, and helping others uh, run it efficiently. But just to give you an idea of a population that one care manager can, can serve, um, Usually, if it's a busy five, six uh, doctor uh, primary care practice, and I'm going to give an example of an adult practice, but let's say a panel of 10,000 to 12,000 patients, um, we actually able to serve that with one full-time uh, counselor who will provide services uh, like comprehensive management and then uh, eight to 10 uh, therapy sessions as needed to those individuals and then run, uh, you know, uh, 
We have some technology built in behind this. As I said, we maintain registries. We don't let anybody fall through the cracks. So there's, there's, there's a whole population health approach to it. Um, but then, you know, within their workload is also uh, one hour a week meeting with a psychiatric supervisor. Um, and, uh, and you know, uh, doing some care coordination because there are some individuals that cannot be managed in the primary care practices. So we are calling agencies like Dr. Reynolds are running and, and sending those pa patients there or to, to our other outpatient facilities. So care coordination, therapy services, you know, maintaining a registry, having supervision, um, uh, all that, you know, for a 10,000 to 12,000 population we can manage by, by one uh, counselor. And then the psychiatrist, are able to, to manage, um, like, you know, with a, if I have a, uh, a psychiatrist who's half time to the program, they can oversee several. I, do not, I don't wanna quote you just a figure like that, but I would imagine uh, six, seven, eight uh, care managers that they're able to supervise, plus provide telepsychiatry services. We cover all our uh, 60s odd practices by telepsychiatry escalation protocols. So that means that if, if one of these patients that are being seen by the counselor really need to see a psychiatrist, you know, um, they can be, they get an appointment within a week. Uh, and we're able to do that uh, together by two part-time psychiatrists that cover that practice. And they're not even full-time themselves. So um, it's, it's a really robust program, which helps, uh, you know, treat many. And we have actually very good outcomes. We show that we are improving, uh, the depression and anxiety outcomes are uh, about 60 to 70% of the patients are getting significant improvement, which is the best you can do with, unfortunately uh, in depression uh, with our medications, you know, whether you take Zoloft, Prozac, or any of these antidepressants, only about two thirds of the individuals get better. Uh, so it, it really is uh, a best of class outcomes that we show also with the program. I hope that answered your question. Oh, yes. Yes, please. I and I'm not the only one to ask questions. And the audience, please submit questions also. This. I just want to add something to uh, Dr. Sapper's comments um, that there has been, as we know, a shortfall in terms of mental health uh, uh, practitioners. And one of the things we're doing now, and I'm why I'm so happy that Northwell is expanding and some of the other major medical systems are also expanding in integrated healthcare is that we're now training uh, students. Our mental health counseling program is now training students specifically to work within integrated uh, collaborative care uh, practices. So it's worked hand in hand nicely where there was a deficit. Uh, there's now an increasing body or pool of, in, of, you know, new graduates, I can't speak for the advanced uh, people in the field, but the new graduates who are coming out prepared to work in that setting. So it works really very nicely together and I'm sure helps in its success. Dr. Reynolds, you, you were cited for people turning to uh, you for services. What happens when you get references? Do you have enough capacity? Um, are you overwhelmed? Where would you like to go with all of that? No, well, look, I was, I was interested to hear Dr. Sapper's comments related to the workforce uh, shortages, because quite frankly, I feel like all my people go and leave and go work at Northwell. So um, I guess you're not getting them either. Um, you know, so, you know, I, I do want to comment on that because it, it's significant. And, you know, Kemp, in preparing for this, I shared with you and some of the other panelists that I've actually had social workers who have been in the game for a long time, maybe too long, who have said, you know what? I'm gonna take some time off. I'll do a few virtual telehealth sexual sessions per, per week. And I wanna just live my life after a long career. And you know, the salaries we offer when matched with the level of stress that clinicians are feeling these days and having to balance their own needs with client needs that are off the charts, uh, the need for documentation has pushed a lot of people out of the space. And some of the virtual platforms, um, Talkspace, you know, BetterHelp, you know, although they don't pay as well as we do, people get to work at home in their pajamas and make almost as much without a lot of the heartache. And so we are having a hard time recruiting people. The replacement costs are, you know, 20% more than they were a year ago and government funding, you know, hasn't changed to that level. So we do have a shortage of people who are willing to work in the space. 
one of the areas that we've combated that is to provide some services versus peer navigators and other folks along those lines. And so in our children's mental health program, we have a very strong stable of family advocates, that is parents who have lived with a child who has a serious emotional disturbance to coach other parents, not to provide clinical services, those are different. Um, and the same thing goes for our recovery coaches. They're all people who have lived experience. They're all folks who wanna take that lived experience, build, some, build an experience based on the community, help others, and at the same time, pursue their academic degrees. That has not only created opportunities for people who might not have had those opportunities, but it has also helped fill some of the gap in, in, the, in the workforce. I will say when it comes to child psychiatry, um, you know, appointments are several months out. And you know, I always question whenever you get an appointment right away, let, let's go to Castle Connolly and see how this person rates because there's a reason. And so you know, one of the things that we know is that there's just a shortage of care across the board, whether we're talking about social workers willing to work for $24 an hour when they can make the same in Target holding towels with a lot less stress or child psychiatrists and adolescent psychiatrists. So that's, that's a big issue. You know, one of the things that um, Dr. Sapra mentioned that I wish I had mentioned, um, so thank you for mentioning, was the use of technology and apps. Because I do think that's an area where there is incredible potential, incredible possibilities. You know, as, as he said, there's a number of apps on the market now, but some of them are, a lot of them are actually really good based on CBT and are coupled with real-time care, whether that includes MAT for OUD, opioid use disorders. Um, what, what do all those acronyms mean? Yeah, so CBT is a form of therapy. Any of you who have used, and, and I say this as a proud user, use Noom to monitor your calorie intake. Um, you know that a lot of these apps actually give you some structure, actually give you some education, check in with you about your behaviors, whether that be how you're feeling and how you're maintaining your emotional well-being uh, or things that monitor your food intake and such. But there's a whole suite of products that have been developed for folks who struggle with um, substance use disorders, whether it's alcohol use, and there's an app called Monument that deals with that, um, or um, pair therapeutics, which is kind of the, 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 they're kind of gotten a ton of the market share around opioid use disorder. And the notion of integrating clinically based care with community based support that might include peers with a technology based solution. Um, the folks who I see that are doing the best are folks that are pulling tools from a couple different places, not simply from going to treatment for X amount of days and then getting the pat on the back and the graduation certificate. It's folks that are pulling at all of these different tools available in the external community. And so I was happy to hear about the use of technology. Again, I'm not of the mindset that, you know, anxiety, depression, there's an app for that. If we can give people, a, a, you know, an, an app out of the Apple store and they're gonna be okay but it's a really, really important tool, particularly for young people that tend to gravitate in that direction anyway. I'm kind of switching topics here, but I'm trying to mixing up this, the <clears throat> location of the problems. Dr. Sapra's illustration is very good for introducing mental health into the physical health setting. What about somebody who's just doing mental health treatment and it is really then obvious there's other comorbidities, there's diabetes, there's coronary disease, there's something else that should be treated. How do you bring them over to the physical health side and yet not lose whatever benefits they're getting from being mental counseled in mental health? One of the things that I think is the issue, uh, rather than what, how you frame the question, is the other way around. People going to physical, uh, you know, physicians for physical concerns and not necessarily getting the appropriate mental health uh, follow up. They, in fact, I think two thirds of people who are taking uh, psychotropic medications are actually prescribed those medications through their PCP. And so the medication is given as a form of treatment and 
to capitalize on Jeffrey's comments about one option is not the best. It's usually uh, a multiple of approaches, you know, multiplicity of approaches that can best help a, a client. But that client goes away from the doctor's office simply with the medication, is not supported by mental health support in terms of therapeutic or clinical care. Uh, yes, there are increased access options now, including telehealth, to some extent, uh, and the apps. But the truth is there's very little connection that is has been fostered until this effort of integrated behavioral health where it becomes a mission, where medical professionals now are, as Dr. Sapra uh, indicated, assessing right from the beginning for depression. You know, the, there's an instrument, the PHQ-2 and the PHQ-9, where the, each patient is, uh, looked at from an initial perspective, is there some form of a mental health dynamic here that needs to be addressed? Um, so I think that's the way. I don't know if it's- you, your, your, point's, your point's great and it's well made. So how do you introduce that into the system? Well, that's where, that's where systems like Northwell come into play, that, that they're developing these integrated systems. An individual practice, the number of of physicians who are now in individual independent practice, and Dr. Sapri know this better than I, has decreased significantly, uh, especially here on Long Island, that, that more and more physicians are connecting with one of the five or six major medical uh, systems in the region. So they, they're not in a position, individual practices are not in a position easily to take on integrated care. It's the, the larger systems uh, that are actually fueling this and, and promoting this movement, uh, you know, in, in our region. Yeah, I mean, I, I would add that um, there are multiple ways to do integrated care. And again, it, it sort of varies from um, a primary care model where I, uh, how I see it is there is more stickiness, right? The patient has a long-term relationship, a trusted relationship with their primary care provider and or a pediatrician. Uh, and you wanna come into that setting where the patient already is there. It's already destigmatized. Everybody goes to their medical doctors and you're providing behavioral health care there. But I think the other thing that you were asking about was, was if you're a behavioral health provider and you're seeing medical conditions, how are you addressing that? So we have something which uh, New York State called reverse integration, where we have put in primary care providers in our behavioral health clinics. Uh, and then there are care coordination services that we have set up. Uh, I believe for certain diseases, uh, you have to just set up like subspecialty integrated care models. In Northwell, a good example of that is uh, is psycho-oncology. So we have uh, embedded behavioral health in our oncology division. Uh, we are, we're starting some new programs uh, such as uh, uh, a transplant medicine psychiatry program where people, people who are getting transplants. Uh, by the way, I love working with these programs. They have money. Uh, you know, everybody in behavioral health knows we have no money uh, to, to develop programs, get funding, but it's great to go to neurosurgery and, and, and transplant medicine docs and say, hey, listen, what about if we added in, you know, a half half day of a psychologist on your program and it costs this? And they're like, sure. You know, uh, pain medicine is another example. We have a bariatric surgery, uh, behavioral health uh, integration model, uh, because all those patients going through difficult phase in their life, they really need that behavioral health support. And then um, another example of doing this is care management. So we have a a program that, that has actually been used recently. Um, the acronym is MOMS, which I would not know what the full form is, but they, they, they provide care management for mothers during the, the pregnancy period and afterwards. Uh, and, and it's being sometimes provided by behavioral health individuals uh, who are embedded in that program. So if they're identifying any medical issues, those care managers, and then they can escalate uh, and bring those uh, to the right specialists. Um, the, the other thing which is linked to that, which we didn't talk about, and, but I think it's, uh, you know, the panelists only are, 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 are good observers of this, is how behavioral health is funded, right? And we're still in a fee-for-service model. And the benefits of integration uh, are seen in, more in the value-based uh, purchasing model. Because when we do behavioral health really, really good, yes, we will 
save money on behavioral health, as in like readmissions or sending people uh, or, or keeping people in treatment for years together. Uh, but the real money we save is on the physical health side. So when you treat somebody's depression and anxiety, well, they control their diabetes and COPD well, and they don't get admitted to the hospitals again and again. Uh, and that's where these integrated models really help out and show the value of doing good behavioral health and save you on the physical health dollars. And you know, another, another topic perhaps, but you know, shared savings and value-based purchasing, whenever that becomes really real, um, the integrated care models will, will be really um, useful in, in, in actually you know, uh, helping us out with the healthcare cost curve, which seems to be you know, just keep going up. You know, the, the other, the, the downside to the fee-for-service model, which I agree with you, it doesn't create the right incentives around health. Um, but the other problem with it is, you know, in our case, we're reimbursed $29 for a session that costs 35 to provide. So fee-for-service isn't working for the providers either, quite frankly. Um, you know, there, 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 are, there are pretty simple ways to better integrate behavioral health care into overall primary care. And, you know, at the system, Dr. Kapoor has been a leader in, in expert screening, brief intervention, referral to treatment. And for a long time, you know, primary care docs would say, well, I'm not an expert in anxiety, depression, or substance use. And so there's really not much I can do. Yeah, but you can ask four or five questions of your patients and you can ask them about their alcohol use. You know, COVID provides a perfect example, a perfect opportunity to say to somebody, hey, did your the drinking increase over the course of the past year or so. Same thing when it comes to anxiety and depression, whether or not you're gonna do a full screen, you know, we probably have those um, wall decals where we used to ask people to point at a smiley face to indicate their level of pain. We could actually use that now to talk about how people are feeling. Um, and, and most of those conversations don't happen and they typically haven't happened because the average primary care doc has a very short amount of time with which to see you in which they're gonna focus on the most pressing concerns, but there's actually reimbursement available for SBIRT. And, and for a lot of folks, it's the only place where you can actually have some of those conversations. I would just as quickly say, those conversations don't take place in generally in walk-in medical scenarios. And I think as people revert back to getting general practitioners, um, you're going to see the possibility of those discussions increasing over time. But, you know, we've often looked at integrated care as like the gold standard and it's complicated. It's actually not that complicated. We simply need to open the dialogue and start asking some of the questions. As value-based care takes more and more hold in primary care, um, and then with, with the things you can discover uh, that are bothering people that are mentally health related, you can actually drive a better outcome for value-based. And that way you can theoretically uh, better the reimbursement system. Um, that's value-based care is theory. And then you have levels one, two, and three in value-based care. Um, get you into the higher order of mathematics and calculus. I want to switch the topic for, uh, go back to one thing that you, you, you had a slide on, uh, Dr. Sapra, and that was school-based. And um, to explain, because it seems to me that is an extraordinary valuable uh, endeavor that you've, you, you've embarked on. And um, I just wonder if you could explain exactly how it works uh, on the school-based in terms of specifics. Yeah, the need really uh, was um, there are there are school students who would um, would say something to a teacher which may be of concerning or to another uh, student, and uh, the schools will need evaluations to be done quickly. And as Dr. Reynolds was saying earlier, you want a child psychiatrist appointment. You know, it's, it's usually two to three months wait. Um, but there are emotional needs that just need to be addressed at that time. School refusal is another uh, such example. Uh, we started by creating an ED diversion strategy. So it's, it's not so. What happens is these, these patients end up in our emergency departments for that quick access, and and that's not a great place to be uh, or or to get that care. Um, so we set up uh, an urgy center for behavioral health uh, using some of the district funding at Cohen's. Um, then we came up with this model of providing that urgent behavioral health center uh, in the community. Uh, 
but um, of course, you know, we the the main issue with around that is running a practice in a fee for service model. Uh, you have to, as Dr. Hans was just talking about, you know, you, you want to minimize your loss every session because that's what's happening. You know, the first interview that I ever had as a, as a psychiatrist, you know, fresh out of residency, um, and um, I, I had no idea about the business of medicine. You know, I just knew how to treat people. And, and the person who was interviewing me was in a, actually in a rural Pennsylvania clinic. Um, and he said, you know, every time you see a patient, I lose money. Do you know that? So I was like, I did not know that. Why would I, why would you even want to hire me if, if that is the case? Uh, and he explained me, uh, you know, how, how the whole, whole thing works, which was really opening, eye-opening to me in my first job interview. Um, and so, so to run a program where we, we make sure, you know, there's good productivity, efficiency, we really cannot create any kind of a bandwidth. Or, or have these programs where walk-ins can come in or people can get access based on a, a triage on the right uh, level of care that is needed immediately. Um, so we looked at the schools um, to see if they would be willing to, to get together and band together and create funds so that the program can be run in a financially sustainable model. So it still has a lot of system support, but, but we do get support from, from various school districts. Uh, but then the, when the program is built, it's dedicated to that, the, the population of those school districts, so eight to 10 school districts getting together, building a behavioral health center, funding that, uh, which we run with a child psychiatrist, a licensed mental health counselor. Um, at times we have peer counselors uh, and uh, we, uh, we provide, uh, you know, quick access to those patients. It's, it's a very simple model uh, of, of basically um, providing immediate access and care coordination services and escalation protocols if they needed to be uh, brought to other, other clinics within the system. How do you do the continuity? Because schools are only in session about eight months of the year. Um, the, the summer volume goes down and, and we sort of, you know, um, uh, work on some of the patients who may be already involved, but we all anticipate the summer volume to go down. And an unfair question, because I know for physical health school-based clinics, they've been grappling with that problem for 20 years as to how do you do continuity? So I was just... Well, I, this is not really a treatment setting. It's more of an evaluation and referral setting. And we, we sort of do bridge appointments. So we do not have patients who come weeks and months to the program. This is an access center, uh, but if somebody needs to be really connected for long-term treatment, then we connect them to our other clinics. One of the things I'd like to add, uh, if I can, Kent, to the discussion of schools, mental health in schools, is that New York uh, took a very strong lead a couple of years ago in 218, it was uh, maybe the second state in the United States to actually legislate uh, mental health education into its curriculum. So now in New York State, uh, every student is uh, insured of being uh, provided education, not therapy, education on mental health, how to identify it, the risk factors involved, methods for response in terms of connective to connect connections to resources and those who would be in the best position to help them. So that's a, that is a uh, really nice advancement that New York State uh, has instituted that I think goes hand in hand because these programs that Dr. Sapra uh, is speaking about, of course they're in certain schools, but it does they don't necessarily touch all the schools. We have 126 districts on Long Island. Eventually maybe we'll have that, uh, that breadth uh, but in the meantime, a lot of the mental health recognition, assessment, recognition, treatment, referral is done by the in-house uh, staff, uh, the mental health trained staff within schools, which would be the school psychologists, the school counselors, and the school social workers. So it's a heavy burden there, but at least there has been a step taken to try to, to destigmatize mental health educate young people as to what the risks are and how to how to respond when they recognize it in, in themselves or, <clears throat> excuse me, or in a peer. 
Well, well know, and I, probably I, implementation of that provision hasn't been done because of the pandemic. There was, there was. No, uh, it's taking place. I can't get, you know, I don't know oh, how, and, how, and how, how are, you, are you, are you finding requests and, and, and interest by the people you teach to uh, become mental health counselors in the schools? Oh, yes. I mean, that's, you know, we have a large base of students who, well, we have, we train students to be school counselors, as well as marriage counselors, as well as uh, mental health counselors and rehabilitation counselors. So we have a wide array in Hofstra in the School of Health Professions and Human Services. Uh, but as far as those students who come who want to work with young people, the school track is a perfect track for them. Now, as I mentioned, we have an increased number of students who want to work in the medical setting. Uh, so the, the integrated behavioral health care is a nice option for them. Um, so, I mean, I'm just throwing it out there because it is in fact an additional step that uh, has been taken that has increased some level of, uh, well, has you know decreased the level of stigma um, among young people and hopefully educated a number uh, of students to understand what to do when they're experiencing it. And we're seeing it when I do work in terms of supervision, consultation and training with the schools, the school personnel the PPS staff are seeing increased numbers of students who are coming to them, recognizing that, as Dr. Sapper said be before, the stigma has actually become less nowadays. There's a little more talk, it's in the discourse, and there's more comfort in being able to seek out help. Uh, it doesn't, in the end, the increase may indicate that students are less concerned uh, or stigmatized by it, but it doesn't help in terms of the resources because the numbers of staff that are in, you know, typically in schools cannot handle uh, a lot of the, the demand. And then when we go towards referral, the referrals, and we've already talked about it, very difficult to make the connections. So it's a good thing, but it creates an increased uh, demand for mental health services. Thank you. Now, I'm going to give everybody the last chance to make whatever thoughts they may want to say that they haven't said before. They may want to wrap up. Um, and I will start in reverse order as to how we made the presentations. So any final thoughts, Dr. Sapra? Um, appreciate hearing them. Um, my final thoughts, um, I would say that whatever we can work uh, going forward in this uh, country and, and educators on, on reducing stigma and creating the workforce. I'm so happy to hear Dr. Johnson's uh, out, you know, talking about training the health healthcare workforce to work in these settings and in all, you know, all different kinds of settings that we need them to deliver behavioral health. Uh, this is not, you know, therapy sitting on a couch uh, and, and, you know, putting out a sign, please don't disturb um, session in progress. This is we're talking about like, you know, PCP is knocking on the door and so you have another patient for you and something like, you know, so so it's as we as we evolve, uh, we have to create the workforce and prepare our patients and providers to be accepting of these new models of, of providing behavioral health service. So whatever we can do to, to work towards that goal, uh, that would be my wish. Thank you. Dr. Reynolds. Never short on words, but I know we have some time to change. But here's, here's, here's what I would say. You know, I think COVID gave us all a glimpse into um, the anxiety and the depression and the isolation that lots of folks feel on an everyday basis times 10. That should create a new awareness in us in terms of reaching out to others around mental health issues. And while we talk about systems of care and we talk about workforce and we talk about stuff that's kind of up here, the reality is that mental health should take place between people, right? And the more we ask people how you're doing, how you're feeling, the more we get into those conversations just as fellow human beings, those small steps have helped to reduce that stigma. The more we enlist and entrust our kids and how to reach out to their peers who appear to be struggling, the more we troubleshoot with our kids, you know, what would you say if a friend said that, that they were thinking about hurting themselves, that kind of thing those kids become our best allies in promoting mental health. And 
a lot of that has to come from us, the adults, in modeling the right behavior and asking the right questions and having the right conversations as employers, as neighbors, as human beings, just making sure that we keep the dialogue open. You know, COVID certainly um, comes with a fair amount of setbacks and drawbacks, but it also has given us renewed focus on mental health. It would be a shame and probably even a crime to let this moment go by without changing some things up. And quite frankly, that starts with all of us that have signed on to spend two hours listening to this tonight. So if you take nothing um, else out of this, help spread the word about good mental health and what it looks like and what it feels like in the way of community investments, but do your part individually to reach out to somebody who might be struggling. Thank you. Professor Johnson, some thoughts. Well, it's difficult to add anything to uh, the richness that's already been shared by Dr. Sapper and Dr. Reynolds. I would just want to say, in addition to those comments, that one of the areas of focus that I want those of us committed to mental health and behavioral health care to keep be, be mindful and to work toward in our policy developments, our educational curricula and our service offerings is the, is the needs of the marginalized communities um, that suffer in greater proportion and have less access to resources to address. So as we move forward to be ever mindful of those, uh, those groups to be able to incorporate and maybe even emphasize or highlight ways we can be most successful um, in, addressing, in addressing those groups. Thank you. Well, with, with that, I'm going to bring the, our webcast to a close. Uh, but first I wanted to thank um, uh, Dean holly Serup. I also wanted to thank uh, Assistant Dean Anthony Porcelli, who did enormous amounts of work, uh, and also with the entire uh, uh, Public Health Week for, for Hofstra's School of Health Professions and Human Services. So th th thank you, Anthony. I appreciate that. And thank you to the technicians uh, who put all this together, who edit this later on, put it up, and then um, I harangue them for the captions and all of that. So thank you very much. Thank you for all who listened to us. Uh, have a good evening. Bye-bye now. Thank you.